Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. It is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. And this is one of my most uh, unique conversations. I am joined uh, by two leaders uh, at the National Institutes of Health. Gary Gibbons is the director of the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. He has been since 2012. He's a board-certified cardiologist, and um, his budget is about $3 billion. He has about 1,000 employees in NHLBI. Gary, welcome. Thank you, Howard. Pleasure to be here. And uh, Griff Rogers, um, who is the director of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, board certified in hematology. He's been director since uh, 2007. He's also a member of the JAMA editorial board. Um, his budget is uh, uh, about $2.1 billion, and he has about 700 employees. And they've written a remarkably powerful editorial to accompany two papers that uh, we published uh, yesterday, one yesterday, one last week. The title of the editorial is Obesity and Hypertension in the Time of COVID-19 by uh, Griffin Rogers and Gary Gibbons. The two articles that they're commenting on and that we'll discuss today, uh, the first is by Paul Muttner and colleagues entitled Trends in Blood Pressure, Mo uh, Trends in Blood Pressure Control Among U.S. Adults with Hypertension, 1999-2000 to 2017-2018. And then trends in obesity prevalence by race and Hispanic origin, 1999-2000 uh, to 2017-2018. And, and, and Gary, I thought I'd start by just summarizing the data that, that you allude to in the editorial and just to, to talk about it. I, I found it so, so disturbing. Muttner estimates the proportion of adults with hypertension who had controlled blood pressure increased from 31.8% in 1999 to 48% in 2017, remained stable between 20, uh, remained stable to 2013, 2014, but then declined, declined from 48.5% to 43.7% uh, over uh, that four year period. Gary, were you as disturbed when you saw these data as I was? Yeah, no, Howard, I think you're, you're exactly right. Uh, this is a very concerning trend. Um, we know uh, one of the success stories, I believe, in biomedicine is the reduction of cardiovascular death over the last 50 years or so, in part related to effective control of risk factors. Uh, and we know and have abundant evidence that lowering blood pressure works, prevents strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, et cetera. We've known that for a few decades now. Uh, and we've done, particularly the NHLBI, uh, uh, had a leading role in enhancing awareness uh, in the public about the silent killer, as it used to be called back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and so uh, with, there have been guidelines for, again, decades as part of the JNC tradition uh, to try to really galvanize the public and practitioners uh, that controlling blood pressure is important. And yet, uh, as you're pointing out, we have less than half our population. Uh, that's controlled. Uh, and so there are lives that will be lost as a result of that. Uh, and it, it's particularly uh, concerning in light of the fact that uh, the NHLBI sponsored the SPRINT trial, which I think is one of the milestone um, trials of, of the 21st century in showing that even more aggressive lowering blood pressure prevents strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, and saves lives. So when the data is getting stronger and stronger, about how important blood pressure lowering is, it is frustrating that uh, the control rates seem to be lagging. Gary, the other thing, and then Griff, we'll get, we'll get to the obesity data. The black-white differences are more pronounced than ever before, and they're very pronounced around who has access to regular care and who doesn't have access to regular care. I, I do also want to make sure people recognize that the definitions used to represent control was identical during the reporting period, e even though there were some new definitions uh, in introduced. There's a sensitivity analysis based upon the new definitions, but these comparisons are apples to apples over the years. Gary, can you just comment on the black-white difference and access to care? Obviously, they often go together, but, but I'm wondering if you could say a few words about that. 
you know, that that is a, a, another element of the disturbing trend. It, it, uh, who seems to be most adversely affected? Uh, and indeed, uh, that that has a, a social dimension to it, uh, uh, in which uh, I think it, it lays bare some of the social determinants of health uh, that is feeding into uh, racial and, and other health disparities. Uh, and so really, since it's a matter of doing what we know works, what we already have evidence, it's really uh, back to how do we deliver quality care to all Americans? And, and this is really um, a canary in a coal mine. It's telling us we have a problem here uh, in making sure that all communities uh, are getting evidence-based care. Now, Griff, the data around obesity, I don't think will surprise people. Um, when we talk about an epidemic or a pandemic, obesity has become a worldwide problem. It is a pandemic. So I'll I'll read the data that you summarize in the editorial. Uh, again, 1999-2017 um, increased the prevalence of obesity increased from 27.5% to 43% for men and 33% to 41% for women. And the prevalence of severe obesity, BMI greater than 40, increased from 3.1% to 6.9% for men and 6.2% to 9.7% for women. And again, a, a number of subgroup analysis, the prevalence of both uh, are greater, that is, uh, obesity and severe obesity for non-Hispanic black women, 56.9% and 18.9% respectfully, and Mexican-American women, 49.6% and 14.5%, then white women, 39.8% and 11.3%. We've been at it for a decade, Griff. I mean, we've talked, it at, we've right. talked about it at our editorial board. Is it intractable? Is it, is it, can we not solve this problem? Well, it is a problem. And in fact, one of the, one of the, let me just highlight one additional subset analysis that was reported in the Ogden paper. They looked at, at individuals between six to 11 years ah. in, in adolescence in which the prevalence have also increased from 15.8% to 19.3 and 16% to, to about 21% respectively in those two groups. And this is particularly concerning because we know that severe obesity is a major risk factor for type 2 diabetes in youth, which is a more severe course and responds less well than treatments uh, for diabetes later in life. But the second point in an adults, again, we're just seeing this, this general increase in this epidemic of obesity, as, as you pointed out. I mean, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic now and, and obesity, you know, if, if you were to kind of put this in a communicable disease, it would obviously be right up there front and center because obesity uh, is such a risk factor for so many other conditions yeah. in adults. Cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic uh, non fatty liver disease, which, by the way, is now becoming the, 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 the more likely cause of, of cirrhosis. Uh, I was just off of a just got off of a Zoom meeting in which we were reviewing data on obesity as risk factors uh, for certain types of cancer that have been published recently in, in, in JAMA. Um, un, uh, unlike hypertension, in which there's really a, a, a very large number of therapies available, uh, which is as as Gary indicates, very disconcerting. Therapy either uh, pharmacos, pharmaceutical therapy uh, uh, or behavioral modifications, telling people to eat better and exercise more, just has not been um, as effective uh, as we'd like. And again, this is a, a, a condition because of the, the social context and the other related aspects about eating and exercise and sleep, by the way, which is sort of the third stool uh, leg of that stool uh, we're, we're up against some great forces uh, that we have to compete against that makes this almost a, a, an, a seeming intractable problem Gary what I found so disturbing about the hypertension uh, uh, data is we can diagnose it we have effective treatments and they're not even expensive I, I mean that, that's that's what's remarkable I I, I mean Obesity is so complex. I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to lose 10 pounds. It's hard. 
Um, but, but physicians are good at hypertension. We can make the diagnosis. We can treat it, and it is inexpensive. Do, do you have a sense of what's happened over the last five years, Gary? I mean, you talk to so many people. You fund so much research. Yeah, I think um, one of the other elements um, that you alluded to that I, uh, I'd like us to, at some point, give greater attention to is what some might call the science of, of health delivery. That is, as you point out, it's, it's not that the clinicians don't know what to do or don't have the tools. It does still raise the question as to how effectively does our system um, control a risk factor, uh, and particularly in those who, quite frankly, uh, are on the lower sexual economic uh, uh, means. Uh, and, and really, I think it's more of an indictment of our delivery system, less about our providers and their knowledge uh, than, than anything. Uh, similarly, it, it is a challenge uh, in these communities of color in particular uh, that they have access to the, the uh, lifestyle that we know can promote um, uh, a healthy blood pressure. And so as, as Griff was alluding to, uh, if you're in uh, neighborhoods that don't uh, provide access to fresh fruits and vegetables uh, and yet have high concentrations of places with high fat and high salt, uh, it's going to be harder uh, to have. You're going to have more high blood pressure and it's going to be harder to control. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a multi-level, uh, multi-pronged uh, element uh, to this. Now, one of the things that we did fund uh, uh, relatively recently, late, uh, Ron Victor did a trial uh, in which he actually showed that if you got into barber shops right. uh, in these communities of color, uh, that indeed that was a more effective way of getting the word out and getting the peer buy-in uh, to controlling blood pressure. Uh, and so uh, you, you probably can't tell from my video that uh, black men spend a lot of time in the, in, in the barber shop, and it's actually a major uh, a conduit of, of information. Uh, and so for him to leverage that for health education in communities is, again, a strategy. Uh, mobile technologies have also been used. So, so there's still things we're trying to do in terms of the science of health delivery that may make a difference. Now, I always, I always think of obesity, trying to help people who are trying to lose weight is just so remarkably complex, Griff. There mm -hmm. isn't a drug. I mean, there is bariatric surgery for people who are morbidly obese, and uh, what defines who should uh, get surgery is changing, I think, because of the effectiveness uh, of, of surgery. But nevertheless, I, I find it to be so much more complex than some other medical conditions. What do you think the future of try, trying to move towards better weight control for the entire U.S. population, wh where do we need to go? Well, I think, you know, we, we clearly do have to think differently. I mean, there are people who are able to, um, if, if you look at some of the behavioral studies that, that NHLBI and NIDDK and the other institutes and, you know, uh, other agencies have funded, it is quite clear that almost anything that you do, as long as there's, there's good support for it uh, and encouragement and having people work in groups uh, in which there's group dynamics to encourage this, you will see that people will lose weight, but after some point, it is absolutely clear that you know humans have evolved to defend weight loss, and mm -hmm. and uh, a number of compensatory mechanisms kick in to uh, make it you know more difficult for you to lose the next incremental pound. Uh, and in fact, doing the same thing, you begin to lose, you begin to gain, regain weight, and under those circumstances, you know, people can become quite discouraged and they just give up and, and that weight just comes back. But if you look at the series of, of, of what happens, you know, some people will return and maintain that weight loss, but the greater majority will have a very slow slope going back up at the, at the same, you know, uh, caloric uh, intake or reduced caloric intakes. So understanding what those differences are uh, and again, some of it is biological, some of it is social uh, and, and, and environmental, I think is something that we need to, 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 to go after. 
you, you did raise an important issue, and that is bariatric surgery. And I alluded to this fact that um, kids, youth with uh, obesity is a great risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And they don't, they're really refractory to the therapies that we use for adults. What seems to work is bariatric surgery, both in terms of the, uh, the uh, restitution of normal pancreatic function and, and insulin sensitivity. It also reduces the, the risk of, of, of hypertension and, and cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, but of course, that's not something that we want to prescribe to large numbers mm -hmm. of, of, of people out there. And so we're actively involved in studies trying to better understand what are the, the biological underpinnings of why people lose weight and sustain weight and have sustained improvement in, in metabolic and cardiovascular parameters after surgery. As you probably know, many people begin to lose weight you know, within or at least their, their metabolic and cardiovascular numbers actually improve within hours or days before they've lost substantial amounts of weight. And what it is intrinsically that's, that's causing that is, is, is yet to be determined. It's probably multifactorial. But we're actively uh, uh, engaged in supporting and conducting studies to better understand that so that ultimately people may benefit from bariatric surgery without having to undergo surgery. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think of these as almost like the twin evils uh, for, around population health. If if you made me czar, health czar, I would say we're going to focus on two conditions at the population level, hypertension and obesity. It, mm -hmm. it is not lost on people who are watching this that the two of you are black men in America. And you you touch on structural racism in, in the editorial, and I really appreciated uh, that you were willing to talk about that. Uh, it's been a very painful six months. I, I, I can't really understand what it's meant to black America. I can try, but I am not black. And so there's a long history of slavery, and you touch on structural racism. How do, you, how do, how do the two of you think about that vis 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 your institute, personally, vis a vis hypertension and obesity. Griff, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, well, as I think we alluded to it in, 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 the, uh, in the viewpoint, uh, this is the context under which people live their, their daily lives. And so if you're in, a, you know, in an environment uh, that doesn't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, doesn't have a safe place for for kids and, and, and adults to, to exercise, uh, lacks resources in terms of easy access to, um, to healthcare facilities. You know, these have sort of a reinforcing effect. And, and I think policies and, uh, that, are, that, that have been going on for years, decades perhaps, uh, have, you know, reinforced this. Um, in terms of, of educational attainment, employment attainment. And that's why I think you, you mentioned COVID. This is, brings us in sharp relief because yeah. these same risk factors yeah. and the same things that put people in, in these types of environments are also risk factors for being uh, inability to social distance, to be our frontline uh, employees uh, that will be publicly facing and therefore at greater risk of, of exposure, and then of course, if they have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, they're at greater risk of suffering more severe complications and and even mortality from the condition. So I think you know this just puts this you know uh, in the need to do something uh, at a more urgent pace. Gary, how do you think about this? Yeah, no, I uh, uh, Griff uh, described it quite well. Uh, I, I think. Um, you know, we were, uh, cited uh, a, a paper that related to redlining, uh, a, a policy of, in essence, disinvestment uh, in areas that were uh, predominantly African-American or communities of color. Uh, and that's been in place for decades, but, but kind of promotes that racial segregation. Uh, in our cardio study, the, the cohort study, uh, it's been shown that uh, the, the individuals who 
uh, were born in racially segregated neighborhoods and stayed in, in racially segregated neighborhoods had higher blood pressure over time. Uh, and so clearly, when we think about predisposing factors, uh, those social dimensions do get under the skin. And uh, it was shown that, for example, that uh, those redlining neighborhoods also had uh, more preterm uh, 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 births. Uh, and, and that's where the, the social potentially has a biological underpinning because we know how much your, your, the, 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 the seeds of chronic disease, whether it's obesity or hypertension or cardiovascular disease, begins in utero. Mm-hmm. And so there are things that if you're born preterm, the blood vessel vasculature, the elasticity, the elastin that's laid down in your blood vessels is different. The mm-hmm. stresses that come from that, that birth, both for mom and child, uh, have that influence. And so uh, that starts to set up, we know, your epigenome and your microbiome and everything that then puts you on a trajectory such that you may indeed have uh, more of the 95th or the 105th per- percentile on your obesity and blood pressure. So, so all those things intertwine both the social and the biological. And we're just now understanding that the biological uh, transduction uh, of those social determinants. So uh, those are things that really work together uh, and, and reinforce uh, these inequities. When you mm-hmm. think, you had mentioned before, that the knowledge around hypertension and, and how to diagnosis and treat treated is relatively good, and a, 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 and the highlight the the Muttner article really highlights what we think is a failure in the delivery side of care, which I I, I would agree. I mean, uh, for for me, uh, and I've written about this. Everyone should have health insurance in this country. To me, that that is what we need to do, and that would improve access and in. In the Muttner article, regular access to a physician, your blood pressure control was infinitely better. To me, uh, this has to happen in my lifetime, hopefully within a year or two. But when you think of your institute, so both of you lead just remarkably influential national and international institutes. Uh, 80, 90% of your funds go to extramural funding. How do you think about parsing out those dollars between lab-based science, clinical research? Um, Do you do you feel like you need to move each of the institutes uh, uh, in the direction of delivery, or is that not where you want to go? I'm just curious about how you think about that. I know you both have advisory boards. Um, Hmm. Either one. I'm just curious about how you're thinking about given this new uh, knowledge, this funding. Gary, okay. you want to take that one? Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, we look like we had a glitch there. Yeah, it looks um, like we're, just... we're back. Okay. Uh, so, um, so, so certainly, uh, we we several years ago started uh, a, a, a new subunit uh, within the NHLBI called the Center for Translational Research and Implementation Science. Uh, and part of the reasons we did that uh, was to start to address that sort of distal end of what we call translational research. Everyone's familiar with bench to bedside and, right. and, and T1 and T2 uh, as you get, uh, say, a therapeutic agent into uh, the clinic and the patient. Uh, but it's that, 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 that end mile uh, where uh, you now need to go from efficacy uh, toward making sure that uh, it reaches patients in the real world uh, uh, where they live in the communities and practices. Uh, and, and that's an area that uh, I, I think NIH uh, has not traditionally invested quite as much in. Uh, and so that's one of the commitments we've made that gets to the space of the science of delivery uh, and implementation science uh, and, and doing things, again, in a rigorous and systematic way uh, to test strategies uh, as an extension uh, of what we do. So uh, we've seen that as part of our mission. And uh, it's still you know, a very modest part of our overall portfolio. At the end, the, the engine will almost always be discovery science in the front end uh, and the clinical uh, research. But we, we like to see that more s- seamless. And we're also hoping it, it dovetails with trends in, in healthcare, where I think uh, related to the things that you do uh, here at JAMA uh, are talking more about value-based care and, and really looking at things more holistically as opposed to per procedure or per visit per se. Uh, and if we take that more holistic view, I think that helps us think about 
the patient at the center, uh, the community in which they live, and how holistically we can get better outcomes. Well, I mean, the good news is that the NIH budget has really grown over the last three or four years from $32, $33 billion. I, I think next year it's supposed to top $40 billion. I hope some of those additional funds have flowed to your two institutes. Griff, how do you no, think... A, how do you think no. about this balance between uh, discovery science, w which Gary articulated, and and sort of the back end, you know, T T4, T5? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with his formulation there. And, and obviously, we think basic science uh, is critically important because you really don't know when the next, what that discovery is going to lead to five years from now, 10 years from now. And and beyond. And so one has to have a, a pretty good balance of basic science, trans, translational work, and clinical work, and clinical studies. Uh, I just want to, you know, again, first uh, echo uh, Gary's points, but, but also just maybe shift a little bit just to point out that we work together and, and the kinds of things that he's articulated is in both of our institute's strategic plans uh, for the future. We're also realizing that some of these seemingly intractable problems like obesity and cardiovascular disease really is going to, you know, they don't occur in isolation. So most people who have hypertension also have diabetes and they may be obese. And so some of the things that we talk about um, that are in the environment that may be conducive to one may be conducive yeah. to more than one. And we've taken this opportunity to to do these to fund these natural experiments and so for example if there are policy changes within a, a particular um, city or, or or district or state or region uh, we use a, an opportunity called a, a time sensitive uh, a, approach to allow people to apply very early in in advance of these policy changes that um, to get baseline data to see whether, in fact, once these policies are are uh, introduced over time, whether that changes not just one parameter, say childhood obesity, right. but whether that has an influence, for example, on on hypertension or, or other things. So, for example, one could look at the introduction of light rail system or um, a decision of a particular school district to allow high school students to, well, of course, not now, but to sleep in an extra hour before right. the school start time. Or you may remember a number of years ago uh, when the mayor of New York decided that these jumbo... Um, oh, the jumbo uh, drinks. <laughs> right. Drinks would no longer be allowed. Of course, that was actually overturned. But we actually funded some of those studies so that investigators could get information uh, early on. One final thing, though, is, again, we have to kind of go beyond just working together, but we have to go across agencies. So, for example, we, we, we've been working with, uh, in conjunction with a number of institutes, NHLBI, to, to work with, for example, uh, the housing department to see whether there are voucher programs that put people in more affordable houses in different places may have a health consequences that one would predict. Uh, based upon what we talked about, the social determinants of health. So we're going to have to sort of work with other agencies, transportation, education, uh, housing, uh, and, and, and really conduct these, these natural uh, experiments to see what these effects would be. Yeah, I've had a, a number of guests on the show who've decried that we haven't been better at understanding natural experiments and just trying to, mm -hmm. and obviously they're not clinical trials, but life isn't a clinical trial. And so right. you, you, you can derive an enormous amount of, of information, as, as you said, and they're more likely to reflect the real world about what happens to someone's life when you change the way they commute or they get to mm -hmm. school or what they drink or they eat. So mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that uh, you, you've commented on that specifically. Gary, the gains in cardiovascular disease, you've been at, at the NIH before 2012, although that's when you became director, over the last 20 years are extraordinary. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the, lay, the number of lives saved, uh, the advances in cardiovascular disease, but it appears to have plateaued over the last three or four years. Um, do you have a sense of why uh, it's plateaued? Has it just gotten more difficult? Or uh, I've always thought 
because it's been combined with the obesity epidemic, you probably saved many more lives, but it, it's hidden because of the obesity epidemic. Do you, ha do you have a sense of why we're, we've, we're seeing a plateau in cardiovascular health? Well, as you point out, Howard, it, it's probably a, a bit multifactorial, as you say. Uh, uh, we have uh, a, an aging population that also, right. uh, with a great, in, a great uh, increase in some of the risk profile of this uh, cohort, uh, with obesity and diabetes, as uh, Griff has alluded to. Uh, but I'm also concerned that uh, if you look at some of the curves, again, there's a, 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 a footprint of, of, of geographic uh, disparities there as well, that uh, uh, the American Indian population uh, over the last uh, 20 years is, actually, is going getting worse. Um, uh, they're parts of, of rural America, actually particularly women uh, uh, in lower socioeconomic status in particular in rural communities. Uh, again, African Americans, uh, uh, a rather stubborn uh, kind of decline, if not a little bit of an upturn. So, so some of that aggregate curve and plateauing uh, sort of obscures the fact that there's subpopulations that are actually going the wrong way, as well as those who are still benefiting from a lot of the, the good progress we're making. So again, it comes back to one of the ways to, to get that curve going down is to expand who gets the benefit of all these advances uh, and ensure that those who are getting a disproportionate burden get a disproportionate benefit uh, related to what we know. And that's going to take special outreach. Uh, in addition, I think uh, we, we, we do need to get better, uh, that uh, uh, we need greater advances in problems like uh, heart failure. Uh, uh, and uh, Griff uh, has, has made uh, there have been a lot of great advances, but um, there are things that um, you know we still have too many people dying uh, with heart attacks, uh, even on statins and 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 uh, state of the art care. I, I think we still need some breakthroughs in how we can more effectively arrest uh, this disease. And part of it, I believe, is actually starting earlier. Uh, that uh, we've always attacked it as a affliction of the elderly. Uh, I think we have to start, uh, now that we have new tools, uh, including uh, uh, polygenic risk scores and biomarkers, to say, should we start to intervene earlier, since we know this is an accumulative effect of decade, could we, in fact, really shift that curve down if we got more aggressive earlier? That, that's more ambitious, uh, but, but I think uh, those are some of the opportunities I think still lay ahead. Gary, you had mentioned Sprint and JAMA had published, you know, the, the major publications were split between JAMA New England Journal and, and uh, we published subsequently two or three papers from Sprint. Um, w when you think of the scientific disco discoveries uh, funded b from, by your institute in the last three or four years, what do you think have been the major successes? And Griff, I'm going to ask you the same question. I'm curious, when you think of the science portion of your institute's I mean, Sprint was remarkable. I think it's settled the issue that you really want blood pressure in the 120s, not the 140s. But are there, there are other things that come to mind, Gary, that you think really represent the next, the next generation of science? Wow, that's a tough one, Howard. That's like asking me which, which of my three children do I love the most. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't answer that question. <laughs> you have a lot of people listening. <laughs> so so uh, I already put the chip out there on, on Sprint because uh, right. I, I think that that one is remarkable uh, in its scope and meaning and, and potential public health impact, not only in this country, but around the world. Uh, it's really tough to to uh, uh, to say, uh, as you also know, I, I think you uh, share a certain uh, uh, interest in what we're doing in the blood plate space. Sickle, with sickle, cell, disease. sickle cell disease. Yes, you've written for us. Uh, and uh, again, and I think the, the 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 very promising initial areas in terms of curing that. And uh, my good friend Griff is one of the leading uh, investigators in that space, has been a pioneer for for decades, and so uh, that I think is very exciting. He mentioned sleep before. Uh, we actually are the host to the National Center uh, for Sleep Disorder Research uh, at the NHLBI. It's really a trans-NIH initiative, um, uh, to, to pardon the pun, but I think that's the one of the sleeper areas, the sleeper uh, areas of research where it has such broad implications, and yet I think we're still just scratching the surface. Uh, for example, uh, finding out the, how common sleep disorder breathing is in pregnancy. 
and how that's associated with adverse uh, sleep, uh, out, uh, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, including preeclampsia and, and other uh, sorts of disorders. And now we're doing an intervention uh, to see that if you, you improve sleep, uh, uh, CPAP, et cetera, uh, can actually help both mom and child. Uh, so those are very exciting things that we're doing. So uh, it would take you another three hours, Howard, but uh, just the, the, that, that those are some examples. Griff, um, NIDDK, some great successes. I, I, I mean, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, but I'm curious when you think of the science portfolio over the last three, four, five years, what emerges as you think one of the great, great funding achievements of NIDDK? Well, again, as, uh, uh, as Gary mentioned, I, we have so many different constituents, and I, you know, I, I hesitate to say one is better than the other, but since you did mention type 1 diabetes, and it kind of segues in, into something, a, a comment that, that Gary just made, I think that's been one of the great success stories in two uh, aspects. One is because we have um, um, developed a way to sort of understand the genetic risk of this, probably uh, at this point, just based upon you know uh, decades of actually studying you know the the, the pre-existing uh, uh, risk factors, genetic risk factors for this, probably we know more about the genetic risk, probably you know somewhere around 85 to 90 percent of the attributable genetic risk is is known uh, for type 1 diabetes and. And that has therefore led us to begin to diagnose those individuals who are at extremely high risk. And this has given us the appreciation that the disease actually exists or the condition exists before people develop severe dysglycemia. This has actually led to, to the development of prevention trials, one of which was reported about a year and a half ago. Right. Uh, in which, you know, just the, the therapy for uh, anti-CD3 uh, has uh, reduced the, uh, the development of diabetes by two years compared to placebo uh, in individuals at that extremely high risk. Just think about it. That's two years in which you don't have to check your blood sugar, right. two years that you don't have to give yourself insulin injections, your parents and sleep at night. Uh, that's a major accomplishment. But at the same time, developing you know, these uh, uh, artificial pancreas technology, which, again, results from the confluence of a number of, of, of different basic science discoveries, translational work, bringing in computer scientists, mathematicians with algorithms to sort of put all this together in something that a pump will, will kind of use your iPhone or, or other, you know, uh, device to calculate and reproduce the effects of of what your kidney does, I mean, what your what, what your pancreas does. That has really been a, a, a big benefit. And again, I could probably give you, you know, a, a list of other conditions, but I just want to say that that may be way the, the, the direction of the future in that we're going to be able to, you know, develop a risk factor score for people and maybe uh, intervene at people at extremely high risk before the development of, of their disease. I wanted to make sure we finished on some positive uh, scientific information since the struggle around hypertension and obesity and obviously the, the, the way it's influenced COVID-19, COVID the pandemic, uh, particularly for, for uh, different uh, groups of individuals is so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been talking with uh, Griff Rogers, who's director of uh, NIDDK, and Gary Gibbons, who's director of NHLBI. They've written a an editorial to accompany two papers. The title of uh, the editorial is Obesity and Hypertension in the Time of COVID-19. The papers are by Paul Muttner and colleagues, Trends in Blood Pressure Control Among U.S. Adults with Hypertension, 1999-2000 to 2017-2018. Very concerning, uh, disappointing results in the sense of la less control now than five years ago. And then by Cynthia Ogden and colleagues, a research letter entitled Trends in Obesity Prevalence by Race and Hispanic Origin, 1999-2000 to 2017-2018. Uh, Gary and Griff, um, I, I want uh, to thank both of you for joining me today. Uh, you direct just remarkable, remarkable uh, institute 
institutes and your leadership in American medicine is so critical. Thank you for your remarkable service over the last two decades. Well, thanks for having us on the show. Really appreciate it. Bye, Gary. Thanks, Bye, Griff. Stay healthy. All right. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.